Natural Resource Enterprises, establishing a hunting lease on your property. This presentation will go into how to establish a hunting lease and some of the legal ramifications of that and why it's a benefit to you to consider establishing hunting, a hunting lease and other types of natural resource enterprises on your property if you're interested in diversifying income and also enhancing conservation on your property. Recreational access to private lands throughout the country is quite popular. It's particularly popular in Mississippi as well. And activities that individuals enjoy pursuing and spend money to pursue and have quality outdoor experiences and a lot of satisfaction in doing are things like hunting, fishing on private lands, wildlife watching, looking at, at attractive properties, view sheds, waterscapes, looking at wildlife, riding horses, agritourism or agritainment in which people come to family farms to see how food and fiber is raised and then also rural accommodations bed and breakfast accommodations where individuals can come and stay on property overnight and have more time to enjoy the property outdoor recreation in the united states is big business the u.s fish and wildlife service department of interior Every five years, they conduct a survey of Americans who recreate outside and the monies that they spend uh, to pursue outdoor recreation. And a, a, a good percentage of this will be on private lands, also on public lands too, like our national wildlife refuges, national parks, and national seashores. About 104 million participants um, act participate in outdoor recreation on private land spending 157 billion US dollars so a, a good bit of revenue is expenditures are made to pursue outdoor recreation and this is breaks down in nationwide into hunting about 26 billion fishing is extremely popular about 46 billion and then looking at wildlife wildlife watching bird watching is a whopping 76 billion nationwide how does this break down to the southeastern area? The numbers that for outdoor recreation expenditures in Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, the Arklamis area, angling is about 1.9 million anglers spending almost $2 billion annually to fish. Hunting is about 1 million hunters in the Arklamis area spending $1.8 billion. And then watching wildlife, birding, looking at pretty watersheds and, 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 and view sheds on pretty lands, about 2.2 billion participants spending a little over a billion dollars. How does this break out from Mississippi? These numbers, it's actually not comparing apples to apples. We took the numbers that were listed for Mississippi and, and conducted an econometrics model to see what the economic impact of outdoor recreation dollars spent, what the impact it was economically to the state. And for Mississippi, a, a mostly agrarian state, a lot of timber production, so it's, 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 it's rural, as, as many people know. Hunting generated an economic impact to the state on an annual basis of $1.2 billion dollars. Almost 700 million economic impact from angling and wildlife watching, almost 800 million dollars in economic impact for a total economic impact of outdoor recreation in Mississippi at 2.7, almost 3 billion dollars annually. So, a good bit of uh, economic impact and revenue comes to the state of Mississippi from these activities. I'm going to talk a little bit more about some specific out activities with um, natural resource enterprises and then later on in the talk talk about in the video talk about hunting leases 
First, though, fee fishing is growing in demand, as those numbers indicated that we just talked about. Lots of landowners that I've worked with in Mississippi and around the nation and southeast conduct often fishing adventures, uh, fishing uh, activities affiliated with fee hunting. So they do hunting in the fall and maybe turkey hunting in the spring, but then convert with fish, do fishing in the spring, summer, and fall. So it can be done quite compatibly on the same piece of property in that you have uh, impoundments and lakes, ponds to uh, fish. Fish management is important. Of course, we with the Extension Service, Mississippi State Extension Service, and the Sister Land Grant University Extension Service have experts on hand to help landowners with fish management on their properties. Many people who do fee fishing activities also offer other amenities like accommodations where you can stay on the property and, and, and fish for a few days and enjoy, enjoy being on the property. Pricing can vary, but depending on what you offer, um, the, the prices can go, go up with fee, fee angling. This can be in, in day permit fishing permits, or fishing leases, or a fishing membership to a lake that a landowner would offer for people to buy into and, and buy a membership and can come fish. So it's a couple of different options that you consider, and um, we can help you look at those options if this is something that you're interested in. This is a good example. This is actually John Hyde of Yamsey Ranch in Chiloquin, Oregon, Southeast Oregon. He has a 5,000 acre cow calf operation in Oregon. And the Williams, Williamson River is on his property. And he offers fly fishing adventures, fly fishing opportunities on, his, on the Williamson River that comes through his property through his cattle ranch. He does conservation practices where he puts in fencing to, a, to, to, a, to limit the cattle activity or li limit cattle access to the, to the river, which helps in, in, in the river quality and water quality of, and bank stabilization, but also offers, the, obviously, alternative water and ponds for the, for, the, uh, for the cattle to be able to water in. And he uh, has a cabin and accommodations on the property where fly fishermen can come in. And from April to October, he's pretty much so booked up where you can come in and, and fly fish for rainbow trout and brook trout. So this, this opportunity for fishing allows him to diversify the income on his cattle ranch and it is quite successful for him. So this is a good example. John is a poster man, so to speak, for natural resource enterprises and, and how, how it can be done in Oregon. Agritourism, agritainment is also quite popular nationwide. It's a $150 million economic impact to the state of Mississippi. It's one of the fastest growing tourism industries worldwide and particularly in the USA. Many states have limited liability laws for agritourism where if you register your agritourism farm tour operation with the Department of Agriculture and Commerce of, your, of the state, you, you register your business and then you, you uh, display certain signage uh, on the property, on your agritourism destination. This gives you some liability coverage from people that might get hurt from the inherent risk of nature, like turning an ankle by stepping in a hole or bee sting. Um, the state of Mississippi has this limited liability agritourism law where uh, it gives some, some coverage offered by the state for, these, for the landowner to have tourists come on to the property for agritours, and they're charging for it. So many other states do this as well, so take advantage of that, of this law in your, in your representative state if you're interested in, in farm tours. Birding continues to increase. About a quarter of Americans participate, spending over $30 billion. It's increasing in demand. Seems like every, every year more people are interested in birding, so it's quite, quite uh, popular. This is also very compatible with a hunting-type operation in that you have blinds and, and stands and areas to hunt out of. These areas can also, these blinds can be used 
for nature photography and for wildlife watchers to sit in to, to, to see wildlife uh, coming in to feed or water. So, um, again, birding can be quite compatible with a hunting operation. Pricing can vary, um, and, and I would do your homework on that to see what you want to charge for pricing, looking at other alternative looking at other businesses that offer birding um advertising have and publicity is very important on a website with any of these nre type businesses i particularly say that would be with wildlife watching and birding um and you can also collaborate with the national audubon society which may work with you to help identify birds on your property and to work with you maybe even to give tours on your property to look at birds um, so there's some there's some resources you can tap with this type of business. Horseback riding continues to be um, attractive. Four million horses are owned for pleasure. Many horse um, riders will come to a, to an area to ride on private to recreate on private land, but also to go on public land with national forests, wildlife refuges, state-owned lands that allow horses on them. And and landowners can participate, partner with the with the public land manager to offer rides or, or, or accommodations on the private land, ride on the private land, but then also on the adjacent public land. So it's a good opportunity, particularly if you're interested in horse riders and horses, to offer this on adjacent public lands if you live next to a public land base. Landowners provide lodging and hookups for trailers uh, so it, it's it's an easy in to allow horse riders to come on the property because they usually come self-contained and can camp um, in their trailers and just need a place to get their horses out uh, there are liability issues so do your homework on this uh, one way to limit liability is not offer the horses let them bring their own horse um, and there's some other things you can you can do to limit your liability uh, with horse riding or any of these NREs. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a, in, in a little bit, but that would be something you'd want to check with. As a comparable expenditure annually, Minnesota brings in about $50 million annually uh, with horse trail riding in their state. So it this, this adds up over time, and it's a way that the state can diversify. And a lot of this, again, can be done on private lands. Shooting sports, gun ownership, as you well know, is very uh, popular in, in, in the United States, particularly in the Southeast, and recreational shooting is, is quite popular. Nationwide, 20 million participate, spending almost $17 billion annually on equipment and travel. Travel-related expenditures is about $5 billion. So again, offering shooting areas for rifles pistols um, air guns shotguns with sporting clays uh, skeet and various sporting clays type uh, shooting arrangements is very popular not every landowner will want to this may not be for you but those that offer this um, are are readily found and can and can be visited quite often with shooters again money can be made doing this if it's of interest to you that's this can be something you can do more homework in and check in if, you, if it's of interest to you we we do landowner workshops we've had landowners uh go back and offer uh sh shooting sports operations on their property and they've done well with it other enterprise opportunities that are that people worldwide want to come and see Mississippi and see other states uh, with rural accommodation, bed and breakfast arrangements on the property. Music in the South particularly is very um, uh, steeped and important with country music, uh, blues, rock and roll. So music is, is a draw. This, is, again, has a tie to rural lands as well. The culture of the South and of Mississippi with literature and history is quite deep. People like to come and, and see that culture. Again, it fits very nicely into rural lands and outdoor recreation. Um, so it's a, another draw to the south, particularly in Mississippi. The rural appeal of the state 
Uh, again, as I mentioned, Mississippi, as you know, is mostly agrarian, a lot of timberland as well. So there's a lot of rural lands that people can get out and see and enjoy. And then the sense of family and land ownership is important to Mississippians, as you well know. And so, again, this, the NRE opportunities fit well into that. and You have a, a natural uh, audience that's already wanting to come and see your lands and see Mississippi. This sign is um, is my comic uh, comic relief part of the presentation. No trespassing. Violators will be shot. Survivors will be shot again. Uh, many landowners feel uh, this is a huge problem with having people on their property because they're worried about liability. Someone getting hurt and they get sued and they lose their property. Um, also, trespassing just nationwide is. It, is an issue for private landowners. We show I show this sign, the slide at landowner workshops, and it's always striking. We have a we have we have fun with it, but then at the end of the day, there's always landowners that approach me and, and say, "Can I get a Can I get this sign? I'd like to put it up on my property." Um, so they're they're serious about it. One of the things with our NRE workshops from surveys we've done in the past have shown that half of the participants are absentee landowners, meaning they don't live on the property. They live away from the property. And so if you live away from your property and don't visit your property often, there is a greater likelihood that somebody would be trespassing on it. Um, and that's something that you want to watch and, of course, you don't want. The landowners ask me all the time, am I liable if a trespasser comes on my property and gets hurt the short answer is no you're not a trespasser is not supposed to be on your property legally so you know you owe him or her no duty for their safety other than not to intentionally harm the trespasser i can't set a spring gun or a pitfall trap that would harm a trespasser um, can't do that, but I owe them no duty other than not intentionally to hurt them. I owe them no duty for their safety while they're on the property because they're not supposed to be there. People that have problems with trespassing, which are, are there's many of you who do. My recommendation is to post your property so they individuals know your landlines, and this would clean up any um, accidental trespass, somebody going across your property line and just not realizing they're on your property. So having posted signs help to uh, prevent this. If someone's crossing your lines past your signs anyway and you're having problems, I would find their vehicle and take a picture of their tag and then call your local sheriff and find out who they are. Draft them a letter and, and tell them in the letter that you're aware they're coming on your property, they're trespassing, and they're not to come back on your property, and that you will pursue them legally if they do come back. More times than not, this will clean up someone, prevent somebody from coming back, but even if they do, because you've notified them in writing, you've, you've legally notified them, the fines inherently go up for repeat violators so i would make it a um i would i would notify them in writing and tell them not to not to come back i'd also uh in notifying your sheriff you can sign an affidavit with your sheriff that gives them permission to arrest a trespasser that they catch on your property and more times than not if you're doing these kinds of things it kind of cleans up trespassing people the word gets out that you don't tolerate it if you just turn the other cheek and don't worry about it, then that word gets out as well. So if you kind of start out like you can hold out and let people know you're not going to tolerate trespassing, it usually cleans up itself. So I'm going to talk more specifically about how to establish a hunting lease on your property. It gets back to this trespass issue. If I'm an absentee landowner, say I own land in Mississippi and I live in Texas, and I don't get back to the family farm often. I'm having a problem with trespassing. People are hunting on the property. If I, if I establish a hunting lease on it to people that I know and they're paying me for it, there are additional eyes on the ground to, permit, to prevent trespassing problems. So this is a way to get at that 
unwanted entry from trespass is to establish a hunting lease on it. And even if you live on the property, you can establish a hunting lease and diversify income and get some, some, some income from it to pay your taxes and improve the property over time. So many of you know this, but a lease is an arrangement whereby a landowner would grant access to his or her land for recreational hunting for a specified period of time. It can be for a year or, or more or less than a year in exchange for, for fees. What do landowners do to make their lease more attractive? They do some of these things here. This is what they've told me they've done to sweeten the pot, so to speak, to make their lease more attractive to prospective lessees or hunters. Maintain a well-defined trail system. This has a tendency, if they you know, harvest a white-tailed deer, they can use that trail to go retrieve the animal. Plus, it keeps people on the trails, which limits erosion and problems um, with people being all over the property, say with off-terrain off off vehicles, um, if you uh, allow that. So trail systems are handy to have. Landowners can provide hunting blinds and stands to lessees who don't have stands, and you charge for this service. Implementing wildlife supplemental plannings to bring game species and non-game species out where people can see them. If you do that, I would charge more for that. Lots of times hunter, hunter groups will do that themselves, but some don't have the time, and if you provide that, that, again, allows you to charge more. Having designated camping sites, which allows them to stay on the property, uh, but also, we'll get to this, be concerned uh, or be wary of litter and that they take their litter off with them and have a way to uh, maintain garbage and that kind of thing. Uh, if you provide camping and lodging, some other things landowners do have a fire pit, providing firewood, having a place to go to the bathroom, an outhouse, clothes lines, again, trash cans and disposal of garbage, um, water, pitcher water, pitcher pump. This is important for lessees. They are looking for these attributes and they are willing to pay more. So if you provide these attributes, you can charge more for your lease. I recommend you have a lease agreement in place. This is something that's important to do. Talk to your attorney. I can help you get started with this, but have a formal lease contract agreement in place with who you're leasing your land to. Having their some things on the lease would be their names. If you deal with a hunting club, I would encourage them, require that hunting club to be incorporated in that state in the state of Mississippi, and that way you tie all the members to the lease by them being incorporated. If they're not incorporated, you need to have all them sign the lease and have, have personal guarantees that they would sign uh, in the lease. Identify the game species to be hunted, wild turkey, white-tailed deer, or, or waterfowl, whatever it is. The legal location of the property needs to be in the lease. You can also, with Google Maps or some of these other um, GIS systems, have a map of the property that shows your property lines, where the people that are leasing it know where your property lines are, where they don't get off your property onto your neighbor's property, which would cause problems, of course, for you as a landowner. How you, um, the dated terms of the lease, and again, for the period of time, a year, or just for spring turkey season, or for, for however long that lease would be. Um, how you get your payment, I would encourage you to get, your, as a landowner, to get your payment up front earlier than the hunting lease starts, uh, than the hunting season starts. That way, if something happens and it falls through, uh, where they don't get their money together as a group, you can find you'll have time to to lease it to another group of hunters. But have at least a deposit up front and get your payment up front. Don't wait till after the season to get it. So that just cause can cause the landowner more problems. Some other things I'll let you read through here in the slide. But subleasing or not, I usually no, you wouldn't allow that as a landowner. Require in writing that lessees comply with state game laws. And if they break these laws, that's a violation of the lease, and you can terminate the lease. Damage to live trees, they pay for that. 
that damage or that's a reason to terminate the lease. The types of stands and blinds that will be used, removing garbage, trespass and truck fire prevention. This is an important one, accepting the land as is. I'm making no promises about the property. Have a good deer herd on the property, but I'm not. I'm making no promises of what you're going to see. That just covers me as a landowner. That way, um, they know that up front. Designated camping sites. The number of hunters you'll you'll allow. I would go to a smaller size or an individual or a couple of individuals. That way, you're dealing with um, fewer people and it's less likelihood of of problems coming about and liability issues, somebody getting hurt. Motorized vehicle use, hunting methods allowed. It could be archery only for deer. That would be something that you would need to specify. And then what the bag limits would be under the state game law provisions if you want to go lower in, in bag limits of what they can harvest. These are things important to think about. Legal issues are a big factor. It's really the main reason that I found that landowners don't do a hunting lease or do an NRE. They're worried about somebody coming on the property and getting hurt, and then they're going to get in problems and lose the farm. In Mississippi, you don't have to make your land perfectly safe. By having this agreement, this hunting contract in place, you are limiting your liability by having lease stipulations in your lease. And your hunters are agreeing to these stipulations by signing the lease. You, in the hunting lease, you're saying you're identifying if there's certain hazards on the on the property, Uh, reduce those hazards or eliminate them if you can. But if you've got a old bridge on the property that you're either going to take down or repair, have that as a condition in the lease. You crossing the bridge at your own risk or do not cross the bridge because of, of, of its age or whatever the case may be. Specify some of these hazards um, and notify them of that in the lease. And then it is up to them to, they sign it, so it's up to them to avoid these hazards and they're aware of them. So that helps you um, to 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 reduce your liability on your property. But in Mississippi, you just have to be a reasonable and prudent person to eliminate and warn people about hazards. So that would be what I would encourage you to do. Have well-written leases and contracts, having your attorney review them, the use of liability waivers. This is, I think, a good thing to have. Um, The way you use a, a waiver would be an important thing to do. For example, if I'm a, 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 a landowner, I'm bringing people in to spring turkey hunt on my property and I'm guiding them. If a guest shows up that I know is coming and I get them up that morning to go see if we can listen to a gobbler, and as we're having coffee, I said, oh, you know, by the way, I need you to sign a liability waiver, so um, do that before we get in the truck. Well, that would not be the way to handle that. What's the guest going to do? He's going to have to sign it if he's going to. He's already there to go, to hunt. The thing to the way to have done that would have been to say, "Look, we're in, we're looking forward to you coming in the spring to turkey hunt with us, and I'm going to send you a package of information about the property and about me." And in there is a liability uh, waiver and sign that. It's a way I can keep my insurance premiums at a, at a modest level um, and send that back to me. That way that guest can think about whether they want to sign that or not. They sign it and send it back to me and we're good to go in the spring when the spring comes around for the turkey hunt. That's the way to do a liability waiver, but I think it's important to have those executed. Some states don't allow them. I know Louisiana does not with Napoleonic law, but in Mississippi there, um, we encourage landowners to use them. So check, check where your secretary of state and your, and your, and your, uh, local state in your state to see if you can use them. I recommend you use them. Having insurance important is important. Um, as well, you can get hunting lease insurance is relatively inexpensive. Yeah, I think it's a good idea to, to have that. On an insurance, too, as a hunting hunting group that you lease to, they can have uh, insurance. I would have them name you as a landowner as an additional insured on their insurance policy and provide proof 
that they've done that through cert- for providing you an insurance certificate where you're named as an additional insured on their policy. That would be another thing to do. And then business structure, the, the setting up of limited liability corporations. If I'm a sole proprietorship and something happens and, and I'm, uh, and I get someone hurt due to my negligence as a sole proprietor with, and, 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 and a, a lawsuit comes to pass and I'm found liable, then my life savings, my house, my property is all exposed. The way to use business structures would be to limit some of those liability exposures of my property. I could have a hunting operation, Daryl Jones Hunting Lease LLC, where I've got the land and the, the leasing activities tied to that LLC where my personal savings and house are all in business are all separate and so it's a, a d- different legal entity than my hunting lease ll limited liability corporation as a step up to that i could have a land holding llc where i put my property in that and then as a, a hunting outfitter i lease the hunting property lease the property from the land holding llc and then have conduct hunts on the property. So if if I get someone hurt and I'm ne- negligent in the in in my business activities, and I'm found liable in a lawsuit, they could get assets of my 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 hunting operation limited liability company. But the that hunting LLC doesn't own the land; it leases the land from the land holding LLC that I also own. So you can use business structure to isolate some of your risk and your, and your liability exposure. And this is things to think about with your attorney and talk about. It's just too easy to do um, not to consider some of these legal arrangements. How much can I charge? What we found in Mississippi, the, the price range ranges very much so vary. And some recent studies I've done, prices per acre can range from five to $150 per acre per year. These better properties where um, wildlife habitat management is done in, in timbered tracks with mixed pine hardwood, bottomland hardwood, um, also adjacent to wetland property and wetland forest. These types of Real good properties with good wildlife populations on them and good good lands will command better prices in the $21 per acre range. This compares, for example, to 16th section properties in Mississippi that would range from $7 to $12 an acre. Um, and some of these properties go up in value quite a bit, can be higher, particularly in our Mississippi Delta counties. But some of these properties have been high graded from a timber timber harvest standpoint, so the property for wildlife is of less value. But even 16th section lands, on average in the state, are in the seven to twelve dollar range. These better properties would be twenty dollars and above. So um, think about that when you lease. Look at other. Uh, leases in the area that you can find out about are in Mississippi. The Secretary of State's office has 16th section lands that is on a bid basis. And you can look at their website and look what properties are being leased for 16th section lands. And these revenues go to the local school districts. But that's public information. You can you can get that pricing to, to determine what you might want to charge. Also, at least get your land taxes. So these, this is uh, important, at least to make it worth your while. And then you can also go higher with your pricing if you separate your leases. You have a fall deer season hunting lease, but then a spring turkey hunting lease, and then, say, a fishing lease. So separating leases out, depending on the activity and the wildlife species, um, can can increase your revenue potential. 
In the rural land study that I mentioned to you, we, we looked at 800 properties in Mississippi that were being purchased for outdoor recreation, wildlife-related recreation. And in that study of 800 properties statewide, about one-third of the land value was due to wildlife-related recreation. People were buying it to recreate on. So that's, that's a good number. Now, other, other revenue potentials, commercial development, farming it, renting it for farming, timber production, but wildlife-related recreation. Hunting brought in a third of the value in Mississippi, and I, I would estimate that this will only go up possibly in time from what we're seeing in the results of this study. The land types that were important were forest and agricultural lands in the state. Again, these properties uh, with these types of land covers can offer diversity of land types and habitats for wildlife. Um, lenders that were telling us what the land values were that were sold for for wildlife recreation hunting, those those calculated numbers ended up being in Mississippi about $634 an acre. A third of the value was due to wildlife-related recreation and hunting. What land covers were really important? Bottomland hardwoods and mixed pine hardwood forests were the drivers of recreational land sales in Mississippi. What uses were people buying them for to hunt and then also to move over the property with motor, motorized travel related to hunting. Game species that were important, kind of in rank order, white-tailed deer, eastern wild turkey, squirrel species, rabbit species, waterfowl, morning dove, and, and northern bobwhite quail. Of the 800 property, about 123 tracks in this survey 123 tr tracks had been leased in the past, and on average, about 180 acres were, were leased on average, but the range went from 12 to 2,300 acres. The mean price that I've already mentioned to you was over $20, $21 an acre uh, for these tracks to be leased to hunting in the past, and the range, as you can see, from 5 to $65 an acre. Um, in this rural land study, too, roads on the property, as you would guess, were important. About 86% had roads to the property, and on the property, about a third of them did, 32%. 330 tracks had lodging and or utilities, electricity and water, on the property. Um, and, and if it had lodging, accommodations, and utilities, obviously the price was higher per acre. It ended up being over $1,000 an acre higher. For those properties with those amenities and as we already mentioned about a third of the of the value of the property was due to wildlife re related recreation hunting $634 an acre came from uh, the sale of the property due to hunting so uh, again as part of the portfolio of, of of assets in your land why it's valuable wildlife recreation is a big is becoming more of a driver in Mississippi What do landowners, what have they done in the past to, um, to conservation practices to increase their revenue potential? We talked a little bit about that uh, earlier, but I wanted to have these bullet points for you to think about. So conservation increases the money flow from hunting leases and NRE activities. Again, these hardwood and pine forests in Mississippi were important. These wet areas, wetlands and riparian areas next to streams where and rivers were important this is primary habitat for a diversity of wildlife species and again it offers good hunting ground good hunting lands uh landowners that do strip disking and mowing uh, particularly mowing later in the year after herbaceous uh, flowers and vegetation have gone to seed that offers good resources uh, food forage for wildlife species uh, strip disking mowing can be very valuable to wildlife. And again, some of the farm bill practices will help you even do some of this. The types of timber thinning, thinning you do, selective harvest, that can, this can open up gaps and openings in, the in your forest stands, get light on the ground, which are very, very important for um, game and non-game species. Game species particularly come to mind, uh, bobwhite quail and turkey really use these forest openings quite a bit. Prescribed fire is important, particularly in the piney woods, to 
uh, release nutrients, and this has a way to regenerate good uh, herbaceous cover that are important to wildlife. Field borders and plantings, again, farm bill practices help you do some of this. And another thing I've seen landowners do or is to hook lands together to have a larger track of property that's potentially used for hunting recreation. So that's landowners can pool pool um, properties together in cooperatives. So it's very important to to sweeten the pot to to make your lands more attractive for wildlife and hence people that want to recreate on recreate on the property. What I'll close with is is um, kind of talking about what your typical hunter or recreation recreationalist may be like that are what their motivations are for coming to your property. Terra Wildlife is north of Vicksburg, Mississippi. It's a destination um, for trophy whitetail deer with archery hunting. They also do birding tours and, and, and school summer camps. Um, they're, they're quite successful with that. I, they had me uh, do a survey for them of their deer hunters, their archery hunters that come to the property and pay for this every fall to hunt whitetail deer. And I asked them a question in the survey to archery hunters, how important are the following items in your definition of a quality hunting experience at the property at Tara? Looking at the green bars, which are very important, some of these items that, that will pop out are, I think, striking. Being with friends, the green bar over 80% said this is very important. Being with their friends at, at Terra was important while they come back. Looking on down the, the histogram from there, from there, looking at the green, green bar, learning and exploring, learning new skills, being outside, um, this being in nature, this was important for these hunters. Communing with nature for these hunters was important. important. Value reflection, reflecting on values. It kind of gets them off the grid, so to speak, where they can just recharge their batteries by coming to Terra and being outside and hunting. This was important. Some other things, rest and relaxation going to the property to hunt, to just get R&R. This was important. Escaping social pressures, crowds at where they live, or the stresses of their daily jobs, escaping physical pressures, traffic, getting away from the cell phone, getting away from business or, or family pressures. These are all important for, for these hunters while they were coming to archery hunt for, for white-tailed deer at Tara. Harvesting an animal was, was well down the list, and they were paying to hunt. So this is the type of people that your their motivations of why they might want to rent your land to uh, to hunt on in a hunting lease or come to your property. And since these were hunters, imagine what it would be if it was people that birders that are coming it would be. I would guess even more so driven toward some of these. Uh, attributes where they want to be outside and just kind of recharge their battery and see wildlife. So it's not always, even in hunting, it's not always the harvest. It's some of these inherent other attributes or why people enjoy to hunt and be outside. So think about that as you're dealing with uh, potential groups or an individual to lease your land. Those are the kind of things they're looking for. If I can go have a safe outdoor experience, bring my son and daughter and just enjoy being outside, I would want to lease your land for hunting. That's why I'm doing it. Not just about harvesting the three legal turkey gobblers that I can get in Mississippi. That, that, that's not as important to most hunters. So think about that as you're thinking about uh, conducting a hunting lease or establishing a hunting lease on your property. What are some of these successful attributes that make an NRE work, that make a hunting lease work? Hunter satisfaction is tied to the quality of the outdoor experience. That's what we just talked about. It's the quality lands and the, and the value of wildlife habitats that are the drivers. That's the important attributes of the land that people really like to see. 
is seeing wildlife, not always the harvest or the kill that's important, even to hunters. So realizing that as a landowner, I think it's important, and that can help you pick the type of people you want to lease to. Uh, having a limited number of hunters to reduce liability exposure and potential accidents, plus that, in, that enhances them to have a better outdoor experience, to have just a limited number of, of their people out there. It's not a, not, a, no, not a big group. So limiting the number, I think, is important. Fair chase, hunting, um, not hunting in enclosures or are these canned hunts is more uh, wildlife in, in, in true natural settings. And then the importance of just being in nature was important for all of us. These are important attributes that make an NRE work. So the value added benefits, take home message to landowners, uh, hunting lease, NREs can enhance income. They diversify that income stream on your private property. They enhance conservation of natural resources and wildlife. They control who's out there and when, and that's important for you to, to know that and be able to control that access. And then it promote NREs promote a hunting lease can help you promote land stewardship, turning monies back into conservation practices that enhance the, the value of your property also enhances revenue stream where you you and your family can keep this property long term so um, if any of this is of interest to you i think it would be important to consider and we can certainly help you in looking at uh, establishing an nre on your property if you're interested i have a companion um uh, publication with the mississippi state extension service that we're going to show you a location to go and get that publication, kind of a companion piece to this talk that you can read more about how to establish a hunting lease. And that publication is free to download for you. And that may be something you want to want to find too. Also gives a template of a hunting lease that you can then use to build uh, your actual contract on your property, which I would encourage you to do. Um, and not just use a cookie cutter approach and using a template and that's all modify it and make it fit your needs in your in your property but that companion piece is available for you at this uh, url listed in the video here if i can kind if i can help you in any way this is my contact information at, at the mississippi state university extension service um, the website is my website is the last um, thing listed there you can go to that and look for additional information resource materials and then my email and my, my telephone numbers there you're always a, always a, um, free to call me and I can help you in any way that I look forward to helping you in any way I can thank you for your attention today and I hope this video has been helpful to you